Hey folks, how's it going? Dr. Spin. Eclectic on reviews and general musical meanderings. This week I'm going to be taking a look at an album by Amy Frenrique called Music for Working Out. Now, Amy Frenrique is a, a duo, two guys, a, a guitar player named Seaman Nielsen and a drummer named Tobias Anderson. And they're from Oslo, Norway. And their music in, in a very basic sense kind of defies easy categorization, but the, the idea, the concepts that, that kind of surround the idea of math rock will very generally suffice to describe what they do. But whenever you talk about a math rock band, normally, first of all, you, you visualize, I think in my mind at least, you know, two or three guys playing guitars with a style that kind of challenges the listener a little bit. Amy for Enrique differs from that in many ways because although they are playing a very complex style of like interlocking melodies and, and, and weird time signatures that, that kind of lay over on top of one another, what they do is actually very, very infectious and very fun to listen to, almost to the point of being danceable. Another selling point for this album was the album art, I've got to say. First of all, you don't have too many albums that, that use purple like that. I mean, name me five albums that have purple like that that aren't Prince albums. Ah, got you there on that one. Um, and it's got this great collage thing going on with it that I think that kind of fits the aesthetic for, for um, Amy for Enrique quite well. And they released several singles from this album, and they were all using the same artist, Ben Giles. And I'm always a fan, if you can get uh, an artist that, that will allow you to Take the body of work that you're making and sort of make it look like something. Give me the whole thing an aesthetic. I like again, like Roger Dean is a great example of that for yes. And I think they made a really great choice by deciding to use this guy and use him across all those singles and use him on this album cover. It really gives their 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 output a sense of cohesion that that uh, that's appealing. As a duo, everything they do, they're doing with the help of looping technology. So. In many ways, this is a very fascinating conversation that happens with these guys that I started back whenever I was listening to Battles back in the day. And I, I, to understand why I connected with this album so early, I have to talk about Battles just a little bit. And I don't feel too bad about that because their album Mirrored was probably an, an all-time classic album for me. When I first started listening to Battles, I was listening to them kind of thinking like, are they doing what I think they're doing? Because if they're doing what I think they're doing, that's incredible. As I delve further into battles, I've discovered, of course, what, what I thought they were doing was exactly what they were doing. And uh, once I figured that out, it changed the way I listened to Mirrored. And Mirrored is, is still, to this day, an uh, absolute classic. Now, Mirrored is a little bit unique in Battles' catalog. You know, Battles is still, battles is still around as a group. But after Mirrored, uh, the lead vocalist, Tyon De Braxton, left the group to kind of pursue more fully his solo career. And Tyon De Braxton has a a bit of a composer's mindset. So when he left Battles, that changed the sound of the group. And the albums that they did after that, Gloss Drop is a pretty good album after that. But <clears throat> there was definitely something missing. It, was, it wasn't quite, didn't have to quite have the same depth. Atlas was the closest that math rock ever came to be being widespread. You know, people I think kind of heard that tune and, and kind of connected with it. If you were around at that time, you probably heard it somewhere or another. As a matter of fact, for a little while, it was even on the, the Little Big Planet soundtrack. It was a good time. They had a little bit of a taste of, of success with that. And after Town Day Brexton left, I think that they were really trying to recapture that success. But without Town Day Brexton there, there just wasn't quite that, that extra dimension to what they were doing that I think they gave them that, that edge. And they were chasing that down for a very long time after that. So I always enjoyed Battles, and I still enjoy Battles to this day. I still buy their albums. But I... 
there's this hole in my heart that listens back to what was happening with Chanda Day Braxton and wishes they could have taken a further step in that direction. I don't think what Eamon Enrique is doing is exactly what was happening on Mirrored, but I do think that what is happening in Music for Working Out is what Battles could have done after uh, Chanda Day Braxton left. Because it is fun and it is accessible. And ultimately, it, it does all the things that Battles does super well without taking itself so, so seriously. And what both of these bands have in common is their relationship with technology and the technological. Uh, because if you consider like aiming for Enrique, like what if they did an acoustic show? It would not be the same experience. It's not what their, their group is about. But instead, um, Seaman, the guitar player, uh, is extremely adept at, at creating these huge soundscapes, these huge sort of orchestrations with his guitar with a very interesting setup, and it's all pedals. The band says that they don't use any computers in the creation of their music. It's all done with pedals and, and that so sort of pedal board technology. Um, and there's some very interesting things about his, his setup that, are, that really make what he does work. I mean, he's got three amps. He sends one, one of his signals go straight to a bass amp from an octaver. He's got a clean amp and he's got a dirty amp, and he's got like um, two looping, two looping pedals and a distortion pedal and a ring modulator and, and a reverb pedal. And if you watch Seaman Nielsen play, he's playing these pedals as much as, if not more than guitar in some ways. He's got a very fascinating technique that, that he uses to, to interact with these pedals to create the music that Aiming for Enrique is doing. Play, play that. Yeah. <laughs> In some ways, the fact that they don't use computers at all in the creation of their music, they just do it all kind of analog through these pedals, is even more impressive because if you're using computers and you're using sequencing with what you're, you're doing in your music, those things virtually never change. Unless you do something wrong when you start it up or if there's an input problem or something like that, they don't change. It's all, you play with the recording ultimately if you're playing with a sequencer. But if you're building up these, these compositions, uh, through the use of pedals and delays and things like that uh, organically, then there's room for human error every time that you put it together. Um, and they insist that when they make their albums, that's essentially what they do live. They, they, they set up and they record themselves doing this in the studio in a, almost in a live setting. Not only does Seaman Nelson have to be able to put these textures together on his own, but Tobias Anderson also has to be able to lock in with that. And that's extreme. That's a lot of variables going on there. There's lots of small things. If any one thing wasn't exactly in time, the whole thing would fall apart, especially the way that, that uh, aiming for Enrique's music is, is structured. You know, the rhythm is a huge part of what they do. And if any little part is off, then it's, it won't sell. And it'll be very difficult, I think, to, to get it back. So it's a very, it's a huge testament to not only their musicianship on their instruments, but also their ability to interact with that technology in an organic way and make it feel like a band is playing, even though it's just the two of them expanding their own potentials with that technology. When I watch videos of Aiming for Enrique play, and I'm keeping in mind that they're they're not using a click track, they're not using a sequencer, I still have some parts of their, their music that I see happening that I can't quite account for. Like, for example, they have this tune called Hard Dance Brainia with a very like fast melodic line in it that... In live videos I see, I don't see the guitar player playing that. Like it's possible that it could be played and then sped up to double time. Um, but he doesn't seem to build it up that way. So if that, that chunk, that melodic part is sitting in the memory bank of his pedal board somewhere, which is fine, that's, that's, that's not really technically using a sequencer. He also has to match that tempo knowing what 
is going to happen whenever that melody comes in. And it's a fast melody. It's got to lock in. So to me, that's even more impressive. They have to hit those tempos right every single time before they even get to the parts that are that are kind of pre-recorded. And Simon Nielsen's parts are so intricate and they fit together so compactly, and there's so many of them really, that it really boggles the imagination. He's able to juggle all that stuff and, and build it up the way that he does so effectively. You know, there's a there's definitely a sense of there, a bass part being there, even though he's not really playing bass, he's playing a bass part on the guitar. He's also got these super commanding uh, rhythmic guitar parts that you really can't overlook. There's choppy, uh, classic guitar, uh, um, rhythm parts that, that drive everything along that are very easy to overlook, but I think they have the parts that really make the groove so often. But the thing that really gets me that I think that Amy for Enrique is so, so great about is their use of melody. You know, despite all this other stuff going on, over the top of the whole texture that they're rolling with, there's always the sense that there's a melody going on. It's always dressed up in a way that lets it stand out from the mix. The reverb unit that he uses, I think that he says he uses the reverb unit called the, the Hall of fame or something like the hall of fame reverb pedal and it creates these enormous enormous sounds that that really float on top of all of the, the whole picture it has a certain connection with me with a lot of like kind of new romantic 80s guitar you know gu guitars in the 80s were, were using a lot of this kind of big big room reverb it wasn't an unusual sound back then it actually defined a lot of sounds and so them using that on in this context is really kind of tugs at my nostalgia strings in a very, very, very uh, unique way, I think. I, at first, I, I would give it the comparison. It feels like, what if Duran Duran was a math rock band? almost top 40 dance dance floor feel to it uh, despite it's again it's super complex underpinnings and all the stuff going on with it ultimately it's the it's the music the 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 end result is the music is really fun to listen to it's a, it's an engaging experience i played this album for several people and everybody is always fascinated by how how um how easy it is to connect with Unlike a lot of math rock, it doesn't push the listener away. It doesn't challenge the listener to listen to it. It's inviting and invites the listener they're in. And ultimately, it gives the sense that the, that the guys in Aiming for Enrique are having a lot of fun doing what they're doing. And that's what sells the album. It can be as eccentric as it wants to be. It can be as explosive as it wants to be because it has that sense of, of, of being an enjoyable experience to play and to listen to. I can't suggest this album enough. I think it's great. It's definitely going to be a classic album for me in the long run, I think. And um, I'm just really blown away by how great the entire thing is all the way through. So highly suggested. Um, but that's all I think i got to say about it this week. So if you like this video, please like it and subscribe it. Share it out with your friends. Follow me over on Spotify if you want to listen to this and some other tracks I've been listening to. This year representative tracks for 2021. Um, and I'll be back at you next week with something else to, to check out. So until then, I'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you.